Welcome to the Bitcoin Source podcast, where we delve deep into the world of Bitcoin and its profound impact on the 21st century. Today, we're thrilled to have Ella Huff, project lead at Generation Bitcoin and a dedicated community leader. Ella's focus on the diffusion of Bitcoin through society promises to provide us with invaluable insight today. Let's dive into some thought-provoking questions for Ella. Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Yes. So Ella, um, I want to kick these things off really quickly. And the first question that I want to ask you is, as someone that's deeply immersed in the academic world, how did you first become interested in Bitcoin? And what aspects of it did you intersect most of your studies in cognitive science and information science? Yes. So I first learned of Bitcoin when I was a senior in high school. Um, I was doing a technology certificate um, at my school. And one of the classes we had to take was just called blockchain. And so that's when I always say I first learned of Bitcoin, um, but purely from the number go up lens. And then about a year later, I went to the Oslo Freedom Forum discovered freedom go up. And I say that's when I discovered Bitcoin and really fell down the rabbit hole. Um, so it's it's been a, a journey. Um, you know, I had the kind of altcoin phase, um, you know, just trying to learn the entire space. And then ultimately, you know, you realize Bitcoin is the only one. Um, and now that I'm in college, I am studying cognitive science, which um, for those who maybe have never heard of cognitive science, it is psychology, philosophy, linguistics, and computer science all wrapped up in one. And so the idea is really how do people think, make decisions, process information. And so last year, I proposed a independent major focused on Bitcoin, um, which is something I can do at my college. And unfortunately, it has um, not quite panned out. There's been some hurdles, but I think I'll end up being able to write an honors thesis. Um, and how that works is you take your major and you can also take classes um, in other areas. So this is where the information science and business comes in. Um, so really looking at what are the kind of game theory um, strategy, that's one lens, um, aspects of Bitcoin being adopted by society. So what I had pitched was more generally, um, or at least in the title, more generally, how is a new innovation adopted by society? But at the end of the day, it, it will all be about Bitcoin. Um, and really, how do people think about this and start to adopt it? Hey there, fellow Bitcoin enthusiasts. We just wanted to take a moment to appreciate you for tuning in to the Bitcoin source, a Bitcoin conversation. Your support means the world to us as we dive into the exciting world of Bitcoin, blockchain, and all things cryptocurrency. If you've been enjoying our content, don't forget to hit that like button. It's like a virtual high five that keeps us motivated. And hey, sharing is caring. If you know someone who'd geek out over Bitcoin as much as we do, hit that share button. Finally, if you want to stay up to date with all our latest episodes and insights, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. You won't want to miss a single update. Thanks for being a part of our community. Keep exploring and remember, the future is decentralized. Now back to the episode. Awesome. Could you shed some light on the main patterns or trends that you've observed regarding how Bitcoin is diffusing, you know, through society, especially among the younger generation? Well, I think, unfortunately, at the moment, it's not as much. Um, and I will say we're so early. Like, so I teach the new member education program um, for the Cornell Blockchain Club, which I'm in. And so I was reminded, I was pulling up all the charts kind of of the S curve of adoption and, you know, how early we are. And I think that's just something that's easy to forget when you get really ingrained in Bitcoin. Um, but I think there's kind of invisible and visible barriers to this adoption and kind of this diffusion of Bitcoin. Um, so for Gen Z, for instance, I think some pretty invisible barriers might be like a lot of us don't really know what questions to ask, you know, Bitcoin is solving a lot, at least in the U.S. I'll talk from that perspective. Um, Bitcoin right now is providing solutions to things that we don't often hear our problems or we don't even consider. Um, and, you know, we don't have a lot of historical knowledge in many areas. And then we have the visible barriers, which is all of the false news and false media. Um, you know, it's hard to find who are the correct thought leaders in this space initially if you're not ingrained. Um and then I think the biggest thing is we don't have our own nest eggs right now. And so often Bitcoin is talked about as just money. And so if you're a student and there's so much demand on your time every single day, you know, you're trying to focus, do well in your classes. Maybe you haven't started your first job yet. Um, or maybe your first job, you have to put most of that money to rent. Um, 
I think Bitcoin as just money isn't something that you're going to gravitate to spending a lot of time to initially. Yeah, so I'm glad that you made those points and that that's really pertinent that um, someone as young as you are can see that because those are some of the solutions that you possibly can provide to those challenges for your generation. Um, could you tell us more about Generation Bitcoin? Like, you know, what was the impetus behind its creation and how is it fostering a deeper understanding of adoption amongst the Bitcoin community that you're involved in? Yes, I'd be happy to. And I have to say, I was not one of the co-founders. So Generation Bitcoin was founded by um, Arsh Malo, who works at HRF, um, Ashana Misra, she's the youngest Bitcoin core developer, and Autumn Domingo, and she does a ton of great work in kind of the UI UX side of Bitcoin. So they founded it, um, and I joined them about a year later. But the kind of mission of Generation Bitcoin is to help Gen Z, you know, people in high school, college, age one, learn about Bitcoin and then work in Bitcoin. Um, and we've also started a new kind of more global worldwide group. Um, this is very new called the Bitcoin Student Network. And we're going to try and really further the mission of Gen B, um, worldwide and connect students even further to opportunities and resources, um, and so that's that's very exciting and some some new news. Yes, that's awesome. Um, from from your interactions with Generation Bitcoin, you know, what are some of the most common misconceptions or barriers that you've seen when trying to understand or engage with Bitcoin with people that are in your generation? Yeah, um, I'll just say off the bat, one big one is people think you have to buy the whole Bitcoin, um, which is not true. And so I have found myself on campus, at least having Bitcoin just pops up in conversations whenever I'm talking to other people. Um, and I found myself kept having the same conversation, which I'm more than happy to do. Uh, but I decided to sit down and just write out all the different kind of topics we would discuss. And I titled this blog of sorts, Sats Chats, to just try to subliminally, not so subliminally, um, emphasize Sats and Satoshis, because so many people do not know that. Um, so that's a really big one. Um, kind of touched on this earlier, but big B Bitcoin versus little b Bitcoin. Um, there's just the perception that Bitcoin is an aspect of crypto or an aspect of blockchain. And I could, that was another chart I put up on the new member education that no, you know, perception, reality, they're different. You need to consider them differently. Um, so I think those are, those are some of the biggest. Yes. And, you know, because you're so young, um, talking about the future is always like super pertinent for me when I have guests on. And, you know, where do you see like Bitcoin's place in the financial or societal landscape 10 years from now, especially in the context of its adoption by newer generations? Yeah, um, it's so my Twitter handle 21 million for the 21st. It's because I think that the 21 million Bitcoin will be the tools for the 21st century. Um, so I think it's a tool in many realms, much broader than just financial. Um, and we, I don't know if you want to talk about this now or we can talk about it later. Um, but I think maybe I'll just, so Bitcoin versus blockchain or crypto, the, blockchain and crypto have totally written off energy. And the fact that Bitcoin has maintained it and really emphasized it, I think allows it to then go into so many more realms other than just financial. Um, so there's like, that's the quick answer for that. Yeah. You know, I'd love for you to expound on that too. Like when you talked about educational tools or resources, um, yeah. you know, you know, kind of elaborate on some things that might help to demystify Bitcoin and its underlying technology, which is what you were talking about with energy. Mm -hmm. So I guess just to demystify the underlying technology of Bitcoin, and I'll say that I'm definitely not an expert on the underlying of technology. Um, but there's so many great people out there who have put out good educational resources. So for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Nashville um, and Nifty Nye, Lisa, she ran like a Bitcoin LARP about how mining actually works. And so many of us in the room, there were just things, nuances that we didn't quite realize. Um, so there's a lot of great education out there. But again, it's kind of, you have to get the people to kind of self-select in to go and finding that. Um, but one of the, the points we emphasize with Generation Bitcoin, just to go back to that, is that Bitcoin is for, and if it's written, it's kind of just blank, like we have an underlying line, like it's for everyone. Like you yeah. don't need to just be a math or a computer science um, student, I'll just stick with students, to understand Bitcoin. And so I am the head of recruitment at the club, and that's something that I 
really emphasize as we have the information sessions or talk to students because there's a place for everyone in Bitcoin. I mean, it's a tool as freedom money. Um, you kind of get a whole personal freedom element out of this. Bitcoin can restore your agency. You know, it protects property rights, truth, um, generational savings technology, um, ultimate ESG asset. There's so much there that you just have to kind of dive in and be willing to ask questions over just looking for answers. Um, which also kind of goes against the traditional education model. Like you're kind of geared to, okay, what's the answer? You know, I have to do well on this test to memorize, but Bitcoin is really about thinking and asking questions. Um, so yeah, it's for everyone. I guess that's the point there. <laughs> yes. And, and given your studies, like for example, um, I'm a, I'm a millennial, so I am probably a few years older than you. And I was sitting in your same exact seat, maybe eight to 10 years ago on campus. And it's always interesting and beautiful to see like the younger generation kind of grabbing the, the bull by the horns and really kind of do this big change, which is when I was your age, like Bitcoin was really new and people weren't really believing in it as much. And it's just the fact that you can be at Cornell and actually be open and able to study Bitcoin, I think is super awesome. And um, what I've always wanted to know, especially from someone like you, Ella, is more about like the social dynamics around Bitcoin changing as more and more, more and more young people get involved. How does that look for someone just within your club, like someone that's probably 14 or 15 right now that mm -hmm. um, are big, they're big into gaming or they're big into NFTs? Like, do you think that Bitcoin will have an impact on them as well? Yes. And I hope so, because it needs to. Um, so I think, unfortunately, though, on the, the gaming side right now, most people, maybe if you're interested in gaming or obviously NFTs, you're going to be on the crypto blockchain side. You know, you're not you're actually not really going to be interested in Bitcoin. And so that's why, you know, people like the Zebedee team, what they're doing, um, there's, you know, that's why we need more people building on Bitcoin and really showing students why there is a place for them and their interests in Bitcoin. Um, but I think that maybe just generally on the social dynamics with Bitcoin, I think they couldn't be more intertwined because just in our world today, whether we like it or not, you know, money and I guess Lynn Alden would say whoever controls the le ledger kind of has all of the power. Um, but again, on the energy topic, like energy is everything. Um, and so I think because for, so if someone my age, because Bitcoin is how they will be able to, you know, save their energy for generations, um, you know, protect their time, do what they actually want to do when they graduate college, you know, buy a house, have a life, um, is really empowering, like, I guess, literally and figuratively. And so in order for my generation to live and lead a society that, you know, is productive, that is, you know, a good you know, cooperative is what we want. We need, you know, a sound hard money like Bitcoin. And so that's why I just, I really hope they find it and why, you know, Gen B, that's what we're trying to to share and make it easy or easier for students our age to find Bitcoin because they absolutely won't if they look to a university, um, you know, if they look to a university and say, hey, what should I study? What's, what's a good use of my time? They won't find Bitcoin reflected at them. Um, so yes, to, I guess to sum up to your question, when they first enter, they're probably more gravitated towards blockchain, but what they really need is Bitcoin. And, you know, on the foundational side, I think that that is awesome. But like, what if it was a random person that just walked up to you on the street? Like, what would be your advice for a beginner? Like, what foundational advice would you give them? Yeah. And it's so hard because, and this is why like orange pilling isn't so scalable because I think at least where we are right now, you kind of need to make the pain point to them visible. Like today, I mean, so many people have said this, we use money, have no idea how it works. Like that's when I think we've won when people will just use Bitcoin and have no idea how it works. Um, but I okay. So if I just, you know, random person on the street, I would probably ask them questions like, you know, what makes you happy? Like, what do you enjoy? Um, you know, I don't, I feel like what are your goals is a little too deep. Um, but just kind of try to figure out what matters to them, you know, where do they want to spend their time and do. And I think from that, you'll get little nuggets of how to guide the conversation without, you know, being too overbearing and try to just like push like, Oh, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Cause I, I don't think that's the correct way to go about it. Um, and also I think just, 
we're keep reminding, like, like I said earlier, you're so early. Like if you're already thinking about this and you're so early, like you're ahead of so many other people. So you don't need to feel behind. Um, and just take the next step, like just take a step, you know, listen to a, this podcast, like your podcasts are great because they're shorter, you know? Um, so it's probably my route. Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There's no second best, okay? But take all your money, buy Bitcoin. Then take all your time, figure out how to borrow more money to buy more Bitcoin. Then take all your time and figure out what you can sell to buy Bitcoin. And if you absolutely love the thing that you are that you don't want to sell it, go mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin with it. And if you've got a business that you love because your family works for the business that's in your family for 37 years, and you can't bear to sell it, mortgage it, finance it, and convert the proceeds into the hardest money on earth, which is Bitcoin. This channel is for education purposes only and is not affiliated with any financial institution. This is not financial advice. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Now back to the episode. Yes, awesome advice, yeah. Ella. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, shameless plug to my podcast. Um, <laughs> can can you share like an experience from your personal journey in Bitcoin that uh, you know you believe would be inspiring or enlightening to our listeners? Yeah. Um, I, okay. So I think just on a personal side. So I watched this TED talk um, a couple years ago. Um, it's with Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote like the very famous book, Eat, Pray, Love, which then turned into the successful movie. Or I think that's how that worked. Um, but essentially, she described how in that period of her life, there was like so much joy, so much happiness. Um, but then she felt really like sad. And she was like, why am I feeling sad? I should be so happy. And I think it's the idea of when we experience huge successes or huge failures. Um, and what her message was when you're on these two kind of totally different, you know, sides of the axis, what is your center? Like what brings you back home? What fills you with purpose? And so her answer was like, it's just writing. It can be good or bad, but I enjoy writing. Um, so in my own life, when I think about all of the, you know, struggles that are in our world, all of the problems and all that's coming and all that's coming that we don't even know about. I think it could be easy to just become very, I don't know, pessimistic, um, fall into the fiat high time preference. But for me, learning about Bitcoin, experiencing knowledge go up, you know, having knowledge of all different areas I didn't even know to question, understanding, you know, the impact of a low time preference, thinking long term. I think is really um, meaningful for my own life. And like Bitcoin has kind of, uppercase B Bitcoin has kind of become more of my purpose and center. Like, okay, if I just had a really long day, you know, listening to something about Bitcoin or, you know, engaging with a Bitcoin or kind of just fills me up again. Um, so I think just in my own life, I'm very grateful for Bitcoin and the Bitcoin community and um, all the good I think it can do. Yes, that's that's a great personal journey experience. And what I'm interested about too, Ella, is like, you know, you being a Cornell student and Cornell being like Ivy League, it's just beautiful to see like Bitcoin being embraced there. So like how was the academic community at Cornell, especially among um your peers, responding to the rise of Bitcoin and its implications for various fields of study? Um, unfortunately it's a very small community, um, consisting of me that I know of. And then we do have a professor in government, Sarah Kreps, who just joined the Bitcoin Policy Institute. Um, there's another professor, Dave Collum, who's in chemistry. Um, and then there's a lot of blockchain. There's just so much blockchain. Um, and there's a lot of professors that are very negative towards Bitcoin. And so right now, like it, it, Bitcoin is not super present here. Um, I hope it will be. That's what I'm really trying to work on, um, both here and with the Bitcoin student network that I talked about earlier. And so, yeah, I, I hope, and, you know, I graduate in, I guess, a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half, um, that we'll just have new members that come in and they'll see the Bitcoin message and get on the mission with me. But unfortunately, it's um, not as prevalent. And I think that could also be because we have kind of ideas of success of what we should do and the path we should follow. Kind of like, okay, 
you've gotten into an Ivy League. Now you need to go in to get into like big four banking, big four consulting. And that whole process, I mean, it starts like your freshman year, basically. And so, you know, you come to school and you just, you're again, the demand on your time to, you know, make friends, find your place, get good grades, get a job when you really don't even know what you're studying and what you want to do. So I, I hate to say it, but I think in some ways, a big name kind of works against you perhaps with adopting Bitcoin and thinking about something else. Yes, most definitely. I could agree with that. I I remember being a college student and, Mm -hmm. you know, when you, you know, I have this big notion about being a radical and I think that um, being a Bitcoiner means that you are a de facto radical. And a lot of times (laughs) professors can be pugnacious or they can be um, kind of doubtful about the open mind of the open young mind because they're so seasoned in their, you know, you know, tenure as a a professor of whatever study they're in. And I think what makes you unique, Ella, is community leadership, right? So like, Community leadership plays this crucial role in the growth of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Could you share like some experiences of a successful community building initiative or project that you have contributed to for a broader understanding of Bitcoin? Sure. And I guess if it's okay, I just want to make one more point on kind of what you were saying about the university. So I think school name means nothing. And that's one of the like proof of work. You know, that is what is so great about Bitcoin. And sometimes when I talk about Bitcoin with people, I kind of say, look, like we live in a proof of work kind of society or your, you know, school is proof of work. Like you're not going to just like not proof of stake. Like you're not going to get your diploma because I tell your professor that I saw you studying in the library. And sometimes that really kind of just analogies like that are helpful. Um, So anyways, just wanted to make that point. But to your point about kind of community leadership and events that have been successful, um, obviously Gen B, I can't not mention that. Um, But I think on campus, some events that I'm looking forward to that will be happening, um, we're going to hopefully have the stranded kind of precursor to Dirty Coin short film come and have a panel as well. And so I just think any way when you're getting a community together where you can be really respectful and not try to just force a message, but create a place where you can ask questions and it's okay to not know, like that is really important when you're learning, just everyone being okay with not knowing um, and saying that. And I, I will say like, I love the people that I'm in the Cornell blockchain club with. They're really great people. And that's definitely an environment that's there. It's okay to not know. Um, so yeah, so we, next week, actually, Lisa's going to come and do a session on lightning with, um, the group. And so again, just a safe place to ask questions and learn. Um, so I, I say those are some, some key attributes of it. Yes. That's super awesome. And in closing, what message or advice would you like to, to offer to our audience, especially those who are eager to contribute to the growth and adoption of Bitcoin in the 21st century? Yeah, well, I think I'll say what I I said previously, you know, Bitcoin is for everyone. Everyone has some unique story, point of view, perspective that they can contribute to Bitcoin. And I also think it's important that it doesn't have to be one thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the term kind of a multi-potentialite, like you can contribute to Bitcoin in many ways across your lifetime. Um, and that's what's so cool. Like if you just take the time to learn something, to do it. Um, and I also think, you know, you don't have to contribute to Bitcoin in a public way or private way. Like you can do whatever fits best for you. Um, and even just taking the time to learn is already a commitment. You know, even if you're just kind of taking it for yourself, like that is also you working in Bitcoin and learning about it. That's probably what I'd say there. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Ella, for yes. joining us today. And, you know, your dedication to advancing Bitcoin education and community engagement is super commendable. I am rooting for you. I know that you are going to make <laughs> huge, big changes in this space. And um, thank you for you know joining and being on the Bitcoin source. Have a good one. My pleasure. Thank you.